Okay. Oskari is a postdoctoral researcher in geology at Ebo uh, Ac Academy University in Finland. Uh, he wrote his doctoral thesis um, at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome, and he did so on the metaphor of the Book of Nature in patristic and medieval theology. Um, Dr. Yuri Kaala is uh, currently working on the idea of God's two books with Giuseppe Tanzella Nitti. Uh, who did some more work I on this topic, uh, even yes. a couple of decades earlier. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, the floor is yours. Uh, for your talk uh, on the topic of, let me just have a quick look, the paradox of progress, doing theology with both sides of the brain. Thank you so much, and thank you for this introduction. So, doing the paradox of progress, I have first the summary of my talk here. The thesis will be that a crucial element for progress in theology might come from sources that seem to advance little or no progress and often usually do not seek it. And the reason is that, and this will be the main theme of the talk, that uh, due to brain lateralization, there's certain differences between the right and left hemispheres and their take on the world. Um, the primacy of the, there's a certain primacy of the right hemisphere in activities that explore the reality um, but do not clearly set out a set of propositions. And in fields like theology and the, generally the, the reality of God, there might be a certain primacy of non-analytic activities, such as stories, liturgy, music, and contemplative prayer. I will not try to argue that this is somehow um, should impact negatively on analytic activities within theology, but this is a creative complementarity of different activities and viewpoints. Um, I'll begin by uh, explaining briefly this brain lateralization thesis, and I might say from a, very briefly from a bio, biographical point of view, you mentioned my previous uh, my, my previous work on this book of nature that was a historical work on patristic and medieval sources and uh, after finishing that study i came to back to finland where i started working at this uh, uh, state secular university in a very different uh, theological environment and moving into more contemporary questions and and uh, being influenced by analytic theology and it was very interesting as a personal experience to see the difference of styles and different styles of doing theology and seeing, in a sense, the benefits and potentially disadvantages of, of different styles. And uh, stumbling upon the work of Ian McGilchrist on brain lateralization gave me some thoughts that I'm trying to share in this, this talk. Um, Ian McGilchrist is a very well-known, I suppose many of you have read uh, him or read about him, psychiatrist uh, who wrote more than 10 years ago his major work called The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. He argues in this book, drawing on a number of sources, that the human brain has been, so to speak, designed, or whether by, he argues, for an evolutionary basis for this design, to provide two complementary takes on the world which he describes as, as follows. So here, synthesizing from some of McGilchrist's work, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere have different characteristics. And um, McGilchrist explains that one of the reasons why, why scientists, um, of course, discovered this was, on the one hand, um, brain damage cases, which revealed very clear cognitive differences compared to ordinary. Uh, people, and then uh, attention to the fact that the, what is it called now, the uh, connection point between the hemisphere has essentially a regulative function to impede the activity of the other side so as to enable a greater attention of certain kind. Um, so what kind of attention do the different brain hemispheres provide? So the left hemisphere uh, which would, uh, in simple terms, be described as analytic and rational, uh, has a number of different features. Uh, attention to detail, sharply focused, analytic in terms of breaking things into parts, uh, seeking control, grasp, putting order, uh, 
providing tools and using tools, thereby reifying reality and uh, to a certain tendency to a mechanical uh, view of reality, uh, preferring a two-dimensional map, uh, focus on the represented as opposed to the, the real, focus on what is already known as opposed to the unknown, tendency to reductionism and putting things into categories, and as a, a clear disadvantage from a certain point of view, the decontextualized nature and statics and fixed nature of, of, of the attention and knowledge. In contrast, the right hemisphere take on the reality focuses on the big picture, uh, broad, sees holes, and in particular has an sort of openness to uh, the unknown, uh, attention to chaos, alertness, organic realities, living and present, and intuitive thinking, implicit meaning, um, ability to understand and appreciate stories, myth, metaphors, and music, and essentially to understand meaning, which is something that the left hemisphere alone seems to be incapable of understanding. Now, um, when one thinks about science in the broad sense, and in particular also the natural sciences, um, the brain, the different takes provided by the different brain hemispheres are quite interesting because they are seen as very complementary. Many great scientists are not linear in the sense of the analytic rational. They have a great uh, intuitive ability, imaginative ability, providing kind of a big picture visions of possibilities, for example, mathematicians. Um, one might, if one didn't know about mathematical work, one might suppose that mathematic, mathematicians simply work by way of logical deduction, but that is usually not at all how they work. Uh, it's very imaginative and intuitive, and then you go and do the hard work in a sense, or the different, the, the, the left hemisphere work, checking and finding out whether the solution works or not, uh, adapting it, uh, and, 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 and so on. And I think that that's a good example of the idea of complementarity that uh, McGill Chris talks about. The left hemisphere is supposed to be an emissary in the sense of someone who reports back to uh, the right hemisphere, but it's a good servant, but a, not a good master. McGilchrist's uh, thesis is very broad. He argues in the book that uh, the modern culture and the, uh, in particular, Western modern culture has a certain tendency to what he calls left hemisphere chauvinism, uh, the tendency of the left hemisphere, so to speak, to take over and to want to rule and to call the shots and to determine what is relevant and what is not, uh, so to speak, leave this to me, you pretty, uh, saying to the right hemisphere. Um, um, he points out also that reason and imagination are not really on one way, one side or the other, but a combination of, of both sides. Um, and. Uh, of course, to, to, to provide a bit of nuance in this, uh, obviously we normally, unless we have had some brain damage, we use both hemispheres. But the, the question is how and to what extent do we use them in a complementary way or in a way that they are seen as in conflict. This is influenced by a number of factors, education, different cues, different activities that predispose our thinking in one way or another, or may favor one or the other. Um, uh, for example, activities that activate or empower the right hemisphere might be things like mindfulness, music, telling of stories, certain kinds of questions, and, and so on. Now, we move into uh, the question of theology in the sense, uh, as defined many times here, the study of God and how every, everything in relation to God. Um, first of all, there is this dilemma between revelation and mystery. So if revelation here is understood as that which has been revealed, then God is something that can be analyzed and can be uh, grasped and, uh, and uh, studied in the left hemisphere mode. 
But there's another, another aspect which is not a side because God has no <laughs> sides and parts, but another aspect that remains a mystery that has not been fully revealed and perhaps cannot be revealed to us, in, at least in our current state. And in a sense, the question is which one is primary, that which has been revealed insofar as it has been revealed, or the whole, so to speak, the whole reality of God as he really is. And it's really interesting, this would be a whole other paper, surely, but a, a really interesting, just an observation in terms of historical revelation in the Christian tradition. Uh, there are a number of features of that revelation seem to play uh, according to the rules of the right hemisphere as opposed to the left one. So, for example, the scriptures mainly consist of stories rather than analytic arguments and conclusions. Um, and one might, uh, with a certain approaching th scripture from a certain left hemisphere emphasis, one might get very impatient with that, kind of almost annoyed. God, why haven't you revealed things clearly so that we could just analyze them further? Why do you use all these confusing metaphors and stories and myth, like myth, at least in the sense of C.S. Lewis, who I think persuasively argues that the Genesis and many, especially the early, uh, early stories of the Bible reflect a more mythical worldview. Um, so there's a lot of implicit meaning there that sort of points the reader towards the discovery of a whole that nevertheless cannot be fully analyzed and break, broken into parts. And similarly, another uh, key feature of Christian revelation is, of course, the incarnation, which, again, um, as uh, one, one would argue, many theologians today would argue that the fullness of revelation is the incarnation itself and not, for example, uh, scriptures uh, alone, but rather the reality of the Logos may, may become flesh. And of course, that reality is, again, concrete and living, therefore something that can be fully grasped only by the right hemisphere. Um, and further, moving into different traditional exp expressions of the Christian faith, they also reflect a very much a right hemisphere type activity, music, liturgy, uh, theology. Well, I'm not sure what I had in mind in theology, because theology in the modern sense reflects a more uh, left hemisphere. But certainly, so my thesis would be that uh, uh, the economy of historical revelation seems to kind of confirm a certain primacy of the right hemisphere, which certainly is not an exclusivity, but a certain appreciation of right hemisphere activities. Now, it seems to follow from this, and this is my last slide, that there might be a certain paradox of progress in theology. And it's, it's this that um, analytic uh, that the, there's a certain challenge in modern academic theology, and I'm now I'm kind of reflecting on some of the experience that I had moving into my current research environment. Uh, there tends to be a certain primacy of the left hemisphere. Of course, there, there are different, different schools of thought and different uh, styles and traditions, but generally the academic environment itself favors a uh, certain left hemisphere style and emphasis, which seeks to broke things into parts, tends to be reductionistic, highlights that which can be expressed in language, detail-oriented, often decontextualized, focus on the represented rather than experienced as a concrete reality, and so on. And um, more generally, uh, the, 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 the point, of course, is not that the right hemisphere is somehow turned off it is not at all turned off in contemporary culture, but rather uh, it tends to be relegated to that which is less serious, so for example, entertainment. We think about stories. Um, nowadays, stories, we think of so stories as fiction, and fiction has the connotation of not serious, not about reality, not true. Uh, at least to many people, it has these connotations. 
uh, it's just fun movies. But if we would go back 2,000 years or 3,000 years to the context of Judeo-Christian revelation, stories would not be seen as uh, fiction or untrue, but an essential vehicle for, for transmitting uh, fundamental religious truths. Um, and so this is the paradox. Perhaps right hemisphere activities often seem to be unrelated to progress. For example, music, liturgy, prayer, myths, and metaphors, but they may be uh, fundamental for it. Now, uh, is there any evidence? This would be something that I would like to, you know, to develop further in conversation. And is there any evidence that this would be so in terms of academic theology also? Um, something, some thoughts that come to mind that might at least illustrate this possibility are the following two. One is, from a Catholic perspective, the um, early 20th century development of Nouvelle Theologie or Ressourcement uh, movement, which uh, contrasts the uh, neo-scholastic, very left hemisphere approach with a much more broader emphasis on liturgy, emphasis on church fathers, and metaphors, and so on. Um, on the outset, it might have seen um, not conducive to progress, but in fact flowered in a number of new insights and, and discoveries, uh, which was not simply um, retrieving some old treasures, but also new ideas, for example, ecumenism and understanding of different the relations between different traditions, uh, ecclesiology, and many other questions. Um, perhaps another interesting example that might illustrate this is within analytic theology itself, the figure of Eleanor Stamp. Now, this is, of course, very debatable, but Eleanor Stamp, who is one of the leading contemporary philosophers of, re of religion, uh, is very much appreciated by a number of, a number of uh, philosophers in our time. And when one looks at her leading works like Wandering in Darkness and Atonement on Problem of Evil, the question of uh, salvation, her method uh, very much draws on stories, uh, biblical stories, uh, experiential stories, and, uh, and myth. And so that might be another illustration of how some of her ideas that other people have found very insightful in fact, draw a lot on this kind of right hemisphere activities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, um, the floor is open for discussion. We do have 10 minutes for that.